I want to ask you why you left The Daily Show. Ask me whatever the hell you want. Why'd you leave The Daily Show? How are you? I'm good. I'm very good. I have been in this country about a day and a half now. Uh And I'm just watching House of Commons and really starting to catch the flow of how politics moves here. And? Apparently... Trudeau is on Tinder, and that's going to be a big deal. <laughs> yeah, he's looking for a date. To, apparently, he's single again, and no one's scared about that. And then also, there's a lot of arguing over paint. Apparently, it's so cold in Canada that you have to like get a discount on your heat <laughs> or state mandated insulation. Yeah, I, I, the heating oil costs. Like, I'm not. All I know is that I watched the House of Commons argue about heating costs for like an hour and a half, and it was good television. But like with the level of emotion that we have in the States for like gun control, but it's just, y'all just talking about the cold. (laughs) (laughs) We're talking about, we're talking about natural gas discounts. It's freezing. My heat has to always be on. I shouldn't have to pay for this. It's like, well, you should live closer to resources <laughs> like that's the argument and like it's it's been interesting to see so i'm excited isn't it to learn nice more. isn't it nice that those are those are the problems yeah it really is i mean leaving the daily show gave me some some more mental bandwidth i didn't realize how much american politics was just like swallowing up all of the bandwidth that i had to like learn about the world and yeah. explore other stuff so it's, it's cool it's it's cool i'm looking forward to Kind of, you know, getting into these types of discussions on stage over I, the course of the month. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the, the Daily Show at some point. But I, I, I was looking into you before we did this interview, and I, I didn't know that you started out in in journalism. Yeah. So how do you like? How do you make the journey from journalism to comedy? It was always a duality. It was never one than the other. I started stand up when I was 19, still in college, working on my broadcast degree. And so then while I was still working on my degree, I got an internship uh, at a local radio station in Tallahassee, and I did morning news for that station before. I was the morning news guy from 6 to 8 a.m. every day. Like Um, anchor? No, no, no. Just the guy that comes in 10 after the hour and 40 after the hour. I was the guy. WVHT News Time is 640. I'm Roy Wood Jr. Tallahassee Mayor Scott Maddox has reported. Got it. Three stories, a sports story, a kicker. And that was the beginning of my foray into like news and media and things like that. And was the stand up you were doing when you were nineteen when you were in college, was that newsy topical? Like what kind of stand up was nah, it? it was it was all about me. It's it's interesting in that my stand up I talked about me because the idea that, you know, also I'm nineteen but I look fifteen. Oh, you were you were you were one of those kids. Yeah, Yeah. I was lanky and just slim. So, when you're 19 in the South, you're performing usually for people over the age of 28 to the usual age of 30. Yeah. So they just don't take you seriously. So, I can't talk about the world because you're not going to believe anything that I. you, You just assume I haven't seen anything. So I just have to present my world funny. So I did jokes about student loans and book buyback and you know what i figured out over time though was no matter who we are demographically speaking i think there's like four topics that you can and there might be others but the four that i leaned on that were like i believe that we always have a connection on is food sports jobs or love and so the idea and love can be a number of things but it's breakups, it's sex. It's just it, the the desire for intimacy. You know, we all have a favorite food. We all love a sport. Yeah, There's all something we want to be entertained. But like the idea of going out and making money and prov- being a provider, being concerned about gas prices, being concerned about my student, like those things, that's when I started figuring out how to connect with people. Yeah. But it wasn't until probably early 30s where I really turned into – the version of what I would eventually become now, which is more 
just analyze the world, never talk about yourself. Yeah, you had a lot of years as a as, as on the road, right, as a stand-up. Yeah, I mean, but a lot of that time, you know, I mean, we're going back to 98, but a lot of that time was spent doing colleges and nursing homes and like it was nursing just nursing homes. Every demographic you could name, I did. I went to school in Tallahassee. So in that era in the southern part of the states, most cities open mic is only once a month. So if you want to perform next week, you have to drive to another city. Right. And do that open mic. Right. right? In those days, only Atlanta, if we're talking south of Nashville. Yeah. Atlanta, Georgia, and Tampa Bay, Tampa, Florida. Those mm-hmm. were the only two cities that had a weekly open mic. Every other city was monthly. So you had no choice. You have to drive around. But what but what happened with that, and I guess it's kind of a blessing down the road, is that you meet and you learn every single demographic and every single type of person that lives in America. And then based on those four connectors, you start learning what people value and what they do and don't value. But I got to imagine the tour in the South. I mean, listen, I mean, I, I've, I've toured the South playing music, but I got to imagine like tour, touring the South as a young black comic must have its own challenges. Yeah, it depends on the city. But it's depends also a nice way to get to know, like like you said, to like be able to reach a bunch of different people. Yeah, but thing. what you start realizing is that all these people that we stereotype and that we hate, you know, a lot of them are just single issue voters. Yeah. They're not all stark, raving racists. Yeah. They're just, they care about themselves. So they're going to vote for the candidate they feel cares about them. There are people who I know for sure wouldn't give a damn about anything that I believe in. But they will show up to the show and laugh every time and come buy me a drink after the show. And, you know, I don't always know what to do with that. Even now, I don't know what to do with it. But at that time, you just start learning. Like, like people say it, and it's so cliche, but it's true. We have more in common than we do apart. Yeah. You know, not, you, I can't remember the phrase. You know, but but you it know. sounds like you're, you're, you were able to get up on stage, even in that stage of your life, and, and look at, at these audiences in, 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 I will not say rural South, but in non- yeah, Some of it so, rural. Rural South, and, and look out and go, okay, well, I, can, I have to learn how to connect with these people. It feels advantageous as you go out through your career, I suppose, as someone who is just stuck in Vermont their entire lives. Get, get these laughs in Paducah, Kentucky. Yeah. And then tomorrow, your reward is Clarksville, Tennessee. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and if you do well there, mm-hmm. we'll book you in Johnson City, Tennessee, which is a documented sundown town. It All is right. a documented place where if you were black, stay in the hotel. And I've had people tell me as such as they're shaking my hand and buying my merch on the way out the door. Is that your story? Yes. People will come up. Hey man, I hope you have a good time, Johnsonville, you know, Johnson City. You know, just don't go up to Bristol. You know, don't. You know, just just you're, you're better off in hotel, man. But you're, you're, but you're funny. Like they're telling me the secrets to survival in their town. I'm gonna let you in on something because you're funny. I'm gonna tell you something. Wow. So yeah, it's it's danger out there. And comedian Doug Stanhope said this, and it's always stuck with me. As a comedian, you're only as famous as you are in physical relation to the club that night. <laughs> Hold on. You you are only as famous as you are in physical relation to the club the that night. The further you move away from the comedy club after your show, <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. the less right, famous right, you right, become. Right, 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 right. <laughs> you're, you're so famous in that room, and you're pretty famous yeah. in the bar, and you're re- pretty famous outside having a smoke. But the, you go up the street and get pulled over, no one cares that you had a standing O at the Holiday Inn in Johnson City. Especially in Johnson City. Ding, ding, ding. So when you get The Daily Show, when you uh, 2015, you're hired as a correspondent on The Daily Show. Mm-hmm. How does does that background help you in that all of a sudden you're doing a big mass market mainstream TV show? Yeah, it's it's kind of wild when you look back at your career and go, oh, that was preparing me for that and that and that and that. The first 15 years of my stand-up gave me a solid understanding of just the middle of the country. Like that's essentially, if we're talking voting and drama and where a lot of the BS goes down. Yeah. It's in that area. So, yeah, when I got The Daily Show, I definitely felt prepared. Um, I think what changed in my comedy, though, was that The Daily Show pushed me into a window of wanting to only talk about the world 
but from a different, but from differing angles. The like, daily, uh, help me understand that better. So Trevor Noah's approach to, to the show, where if you look at John Stewart's ideology, and you go back and you look at most of John Stewart's bits and the things that are famous and the things that went the most, you know, whatever. Yeah. John Stewart comes in with a sledgehammer and knocks the issue in the mouth. It goes, "This is the problem. Shame on you for not fixing it. You better fix it." And there's punchlines in between all of that. The clips used to be titled when they got viral on YouTube was like John Stewart eviscerates yeah, Mitch McConnell, slams, yeah, John Stewart dunks on. dunks on, slams. That was okay. I understand what you mean. You don't see any of that verbiage for Trevor Noah. Right. Trevor's approach was there could be an A and B side to the issue, but let's look at it from over here and let me give you a different perspective to help better educate both sides. And you can still decide which way you lean, but I'm going to come in and use humor to show you different prisms through which to look at these issues that you thought were one sided, but they're really more complicated than that. This, this sounds, and I'm not being silly, this sounds tougher. This sounds a lot more complicated. This sounds like a harder avenue to get comedy than coming in and saying that sucks. I would say so, but I think it's more rewarding because you, if you do it right, you're getting both people because you're getting the people that are going, that's what I've been trying to tell you. And then you get people going, wow, I didn't know that. And I just learned something. Right. And if the joke lands both ways, to me, that's the perfect joke. So that's where, like, if you look at my stand-up comedy versus, if you look at my stand-up comedy hours versus my Conan sets, mm -hmm. and you can, like, literally go and look at it on YouTube and compare and contrast, I don't really fool with the four connectors within my stand-up, within my hour sets. Because now I know what I want to do. I'm going to assume because we're all gathered here to watch an hour of my material that we are already together and you already understand where I'm coming from. So, no, I'm going to rip this apart. And like in my first special, the first joke is if we get rid of the Confederate flag, then how am I going to know who the dangerous white people are? Right. That's not arguing for or against the flag. It's mm -hmm. just I'm just hey, I'm just here to present a third side to the argument mm -hmm. that. There's some good things about the flag. <laughs> yeah, it's not all bad. <laughs> there are some good things. And it's like that's the thing where that's the joke that I enjoy trying to write and trying to tell. The one that we can talk about the issue. Like We can talk about white nationalists, right? We can talk about protest and and neo-Nazis and hate groups sure. and all of that. And yeah. Okay, we can argue why they show up to protest all of their the different things they don't believe CRT and book bannings and whatever. Yeah. But then I'll also sit and wonder it's 95 degrees why are you wearing army fatigues? Why right, is, why right. was that the protest outfit? Yeah. Let's for, let's just stop for a second forget why you're protesting. Yeah. Explain to me why in 95 degrees that is what you why are you dressed for battle in Fallujah? <laughs> And then say what you want about the clan, but at least their robe, it's flowing, it's breathable. That's so why, the, that's why the clan <laughs> that's why the clan hat is so tall, is so the heat <laughs> can stop dissipate. Stop. <laughs> so if I can make the audience agree that the clan is smart, to me that is more fun on stage than just going. Yes or no, should they or not yeah. protesting? Let's get it. Like, I can get into that a little bit, but I want to start somewhere a little more bizarro. But by starting there, does that let you get somewhere? Yes. Yes. Where does that let you get? So now, if I want to get into a deeper issue, like, you know, recently, like I've been talking about, you know, the when we talk about mass shootings in this country, you know, like if we're talking about a third prism through which to look at something and we talk about mass shootings and mental health and the things that and how those two things are related. OK, fine. But I also think that we're more disconnected from one another because of technology. OK. And when you look at the way technology has created a disassociation within the retail experience, at least in the States, I can't speak for anywhere else. But like we buy things on Amazon by looking at a picture and pressing a button. You used to talk to a sales rep. Yeah. OK. That person used to be a friend. Yeah. That person, even if it was a fake friendship, just the idea of a cashier talking to you yep. about your groceries. Yeah. Might have made you just feel a little bit seen 
and maybe you didn't murder today. <laughs> like, maybe today, because Jim and electronics was helpful in talking to you about coaxial cables and HDMI cables. So you felt, see, so this idea of feeling invisible, it, technology plays a role in that, which also inherently plays a role in the mental health. And so at its core, it's just me ranting about how technology has ruined customer service and I hate self-checkout, but I believe those things are not an anomaly as they relate to bigger conversations about mental health and gun control. Which is the third prism, which is the third way of talking. About. Correct. Instead of just going, we need gun control. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. But also what has not been discussed is, hey, here's the way I think these other things that we just blow off as innocuous are actually contributing to the feelings of loneliness that we know contribute to all of the heinous things that we denounce. So by not, uh, by not, by making a joke that is not, in a time where we, we are being told that there are kind of two sides to every issue, there's an issue and you are, you are to pick one side or the other. Correct. And if you're on that one side, you are to hate the other side and the other side is to hate you and you are to do everything you can on Twitter and on Instagram and on everything you're supposed to do to- I'm to, right, to, you're yeah, wrong. Yeah, I'm right, you're wrong. By- Giving a third perspective on it, you are not only able to find another place for comedy, you're not only able to pull, point out like the absurdities on, on both sides, but you are also maybe able to get a, your a perspective and a potential solution in there, which is a dangerous thing to say to a comedian, a potential solution in there in Correct. a more honest and accepted way. Correct. And I think what has made the job of comedy more difficult now is that... Um, Mike Birbiglia said this. Great, great comedian, kind of a storytelling comedian. Birbiglia said, the joke only works if everyone agrees on the premise. So if your premise is Biden's done a good job, but dot, dot, dot. If you don't believe Biden's done a good job. The joke doesn't matter. The joke, uh, I'm matter. not going to pay attention to the punchline. Doesn't matter. But if you can come up with a third making fun of Biden that everyone agrees with. Correct. Joke will work. And then you can backtrack into whatever criticism uh, you wanted yeah. to make about Biden. Okay. You know, the boldest thing about Biden is that he got the black vote while also having a pet German shepherd. Yeah. <laughs> How did he get black people over 60 to vote for him? Yeah. With a pet? Do you know what that dog has <laughs> done to the black race? And he let one go for Biden, then got another one. And then I had to get rid of that one for Biden. <laughs> and at no point have Republicans <laughs> used that against him. That's how much everybody loves dogs. <laughs> <laughs> now, now we can get into policy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're all on the same page. We're all laughing at the same stuff. And it's the weird observational thing. He, this is a president who has a crazed dog running around the White House. Like, it's it's the one joke I wish I'd have done at the Correspondents' Dinner. That yeah. I just, and my head writer, Christiana Mbakwe, <laughs> we were talking about it, and she just said, Roy, I don't know if you want to get into dogs. There's so many white people there. I just don't know if you want to. <laughs> you don't know why the dog bit. The dog could have been scared. You're just, you're labeling a whole race of dogs vicious <laughs> just because of the actions of what... And like, and it weirdly, but it was weirdly the joke that we dropped because we're like, what? that's the polarizing joke. That that's was the, the yeah, yeah, yeah. You, that because when you get into I'm right, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. If you think I'm right or you're wrong, then that becomes the conversation the next day and not the joke. Yeah, which is the reason why we didn't go after Nikki Haley. Yeah, at the correspondence dinner, we didn't go after um, we didn't go after Diane Feinstein either. Like that was like. The only woman we went after was Kamala because she was in a position of power where there would be enough to justify going after her. And it was a good joke. I remember that joke. That was a good joke. Yeah, Kamala was fair. I mean, like the Nikki Haley joke, I don't remember it, but the basic premise was saying she's a minority, a woman of color. Like, I can't remember. How, but we were going to touch on her, on her ancestry a little bit. But if you don't nail that joke, the headline the next day is man picks on woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Comedian at the White House. The liberal liberal, liberal comedian picks on Republican. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah, exactly. I watched every correspondence dinner to prepare 
for my correspondence dinner just to see. And the more I watch, the more I realize it's such a distinctly different experience every year because the country's in a different place. Yeah. No one can really give you any advice beyond just do the jokes and trust that if you've run them in the comedy club over and over, it's like you, you do these jokes in a place where everyone laughs to perform them in a room where at best, best case scenario, half the room likes it. The other half can't laugh because either they're politically, yeah. not politically inclined, or they're sitting at the table with their boss. Or there's a C-SPAN camera on them as soon as you make the joke, and they can't laugh. Correct. They, you know, uh, um, what's his name? Uh, Sean Hannity can't be seen on TV laughing Enjoy. at a joke about Fox News. You can't. No. So you sit there stone-faced the entire time, and then at the after party, they all come up to you. Hey, man, that was a great job. Is that true? Really? Yeah. A lot of right wingers. A lot of right wingers came up to you afterwards and were like, "That was pretty good. That was all right. right. Ah, That's all right." You know, but you know, I couldn't. You know, I couldn't do anything. (laughs) I did the Don Lemon jokes. The CNN table was stone-faced, and I'm like, "Why? Y'all fired him." (laughs) 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 You should be rejoicing. (laughs) Aren't you happy? Uh, so yeah, it, it's it's this idea of figuring out for my comedy how can I enter a joke from a different place, and now that's the priority. I'm not couching it in the four corners of safety and the four you know connectors anymore. I'm yeah. just I want to go right away. Let's go. Let's dive in. I think that's when I started at the Daily Show. That's when my stand up really elevated. I want to ask you why you left the Daily Show. Ask me whatever the hell you want. Why'd you leave me. the Daily Show? I left the Daily Show because deep down, I don't know what they want to do as a host for a host. Because you were, everyone thought it was going to be you. Can I say that? Everyone yeah, thought it was going to be you. Yeah, my name was in the hat, or at least I felt it was. And, you know, I don't know what they're planning over there. But I do know in the meantime, if they're going to, they got to have a host by January because Iowa caucuses are in two weeks and we're, in, we're off to the races for the election. So you got to have a host by then. You can't have guest hosts for them. Correct. If I'm Comedy Central, I'm hoping that this is resolved by Thanksgiving, you know, top of December, you know, whatever. American Thanksgiving. Okay. Yeah, we, American. We, we had, we had, know, listen, we had Canadian okay, Thanksgiving. Okay, settle down right. with your boxers <laughs> day and all these other nice holidays you have up here. <laughs> So I'm American. American Thanksgiving is the only <laughs> it only Thanksgiving That's all it took. All this both sides and love was, no. was cast away <laughs> as soon as I said, oh, listen, you got you to take everything from three. You know, you got to be able to there accept everybody. There are many Thanksgivings <laughs> and we must appreciate yeah. and all. As, and as soon as I said Canadian Thanksgiving, you were like, absolutely not. There's only one American Thanksgiving. Okay, and okay. So they don't, the vibe was this. We come back from the strike and you're wondering, okay, well, if they're going to do guest hosts again, that's fine, but I already guest hosted. So if I do that again, it's stressful. The job of guest hosting and being a correspondent, it's not easy because you have to take it. It's it's not coal miner or firefighter or you know hero job, but in the sense of the amount of mental real estate that that job takes up on a daily basis leaves you incapable of accessing the creative quadrants of your mind to come up with whatever's next for you. Mm-hmm. And that's going to take some time. Like mm-hmm. We're talking months, a mm-hmm. couple months to really sit and look at what do I want to do? What is the industry going to bear? Which way are things going? And I don't want to look up in January and not have a plan B. On the other side of every labor stoppage in Hollywood, there's a resettling of which creatives become the new norm. Mm -hmm. 07 strike yielded a plethora of reality shows. The word on the street now is that on the other side of the writers and actors strike is that there's going to be significant cuts in the number of scripted television programs that are made. A lot of these streamers that we know and love are all going to merge and fold into one another. So, And the glory days of everybody getting a special, everybody getting a TV show on Netflix. It's one been season. skinny. We're back to 1998. Yeah. You get a special now, it's a gift. Yeah. Or you already had a pre-existing audience that you earned and built. You're Bill Burr. A, you, have, you have an audience. Correct. That you're you Burr have. or yeah. you're Matt Rife. Yeah. Yeah. You're, big you, on TikTok and you, and you start blowing up. Earned. And, exactly. Yeah. Matt, Matt Rife's success was not given to him. It's yep. like it, comedy used to be. We like you. Join us and we'll help you find your audience. And now stand-up comedy is, oh, you have an audience. Yeah. Will you join us? But isn't that another reason to leave leave late night? I'm of two minds on I I've been watching late night since I was a kid and mm-hmm. I've been weird I do a talk show, so I'm weirdly obsessed with this kind of thing. And I grew you up You and me both. I love the genre, but it's 
Like I'm constantly told that we're we're um, it's over. We're fragmenting our audiences. Kids are watching TikTok. I'm looking at like there's kids out there. Like I don't know if they're staying up to it. Ask those kids if they have a favorite news anchor. I bet you they don't. Do you have a favorite news anchor? You can wave your eyes. Yeah, you can do this. Exactly. Show no, the shrug. No, no, no. So no. how am I to parody the news? If they don't even watch the regular news, I should say it's take your kids to work day, and where that's why we're the, that's yeah. why there's it's not child labor at the yeah, CBC. Sure. <laughs> that's why that's why there's that's why there's kids get in back the, on that board, child. <laughs> that's why there's kids in the, that's why there's kids there. But so on one side of things, I'm told, okay, everyone, you know, th- th- things are fragmented. TikTok, it's all over. The days of everyone tuning in to watch Johnny Carson are over. The days of everyone tuning in to watch Johnny Carson and the freaks tuning in to watch David Letterman uh, yeah. is, is over. But also. Late night hosts are still making tens of millions of dollars, and they're still and big gigantic celebrities like Nicole Kidman are showing up on these shows. Like they ha- they're not canceling the Daily Show, Roy. They're not canceling the Tonight Show. Like w- w- where does this stand right now? How much lower can the ratings go before that has to be a real conversation? I don't know. Let's just be real. If we're going to be real about numbers, yeah. and let's yeah. be real about cumulative numbers across the board, all networks. I'm not just I'm not dumping on Daily Show. You have to figure out other ways to engage. I think that the way late night survives is that late night has to become multi-quadrant. So you cannot just be linear. You can't you can, be the TV show at 1130. You can't just be that. Yeah. And if you're going to have accounts in other places, those accounts have to parody the way that media is consumed on that particular platform. It's Marshall McLuhan. It's the medium is the message. The, me, the medium itself Im, Im, impacts the message. You can't. He, McLuhan argued that you couldn't take the, you couldn't have someone on TV reading the newspaper to you. It demands a different type of communication. Love that. Yeah. Yeah. And so Canadian, I, by the way. I think. Oh, oh, there you go. We'll, we'll double check. That. <laughs> in, in my algorithm, he's, a, he's an American. Yeah. Man. And where I'm from, yeah. Marshall McLuhan is from North Listen, Dakota. The Facebook group that I'm in made it perfectly clear. I don't know where you get your facts, but my facts are the real facts. Like at some point, it's getting into that now. I know we don't have the time now, but when you look at everything that's happening, you know, with Israel and Palestine, and the way that the media is covering it. The media itself used to be the source. We are the so- the most trusted news. You can trust us. We are the ones delivering the news first. And now it's like, yeah, there was an explosion. According to the people over there who was hosting the explosion, those are the people who told us there was an explosion. It's just right now for that particular thing. But I could see that being the new way in which news is even put out. So if we're talking political satire now. Yeah. Daily Show or Seth Meyers. Correct. If we're talking political satire and our idea is to parody the news, does everybody agree on the premise? If we're talking media trust and if we're talking about the idea of those facts being the facts from which we will then glean punchlines. Yeah. Some people don't even believe in those particular facts. So that's part of the hurdle as well for late night in a political satire sphere, if we're talking late night as a whole, you know, the Fallons and the Kimmels of the world, I just think that there is still a place for conversations to be had about things that are happening in pop culture, but they have to happen faster and they have to be modular. They have to be creatively modular to fit multiple flat platforms concurrently. You almost are essentially the host of four different shows. Yeah. Yeah versus taking one show and stripping it for parts and disseminating it everywhere, which 10 years ago worked perfectly fine. So what are you going to do? That's what I'm trying to figure out. In the interim, I want to do, you know, sell some scripted shows, write some stuff. I want to act. But the idea of figuring out what is the new way that information looks and how to get that to people in a fact. The other issue is faster all the people that are the freaks who would come on Letterman, they have camera phones now. Yeah. So they're already on their channels doing the things that used to be super voyeuristic for us to watch as a layman. So if the freaks have the cameras, then maybe you're a place that aggregates all the freaks together into one place, or you're the place that gets, delivers the information first, but that requires, that requires a total change in the approach to late night and making it faster. Okay, so that's the how. 
What's the why? I read this quote from you when I was coming in here. You were, you were talking to Terry Gross. I call myself a worse Terry Gross or uh. Terry Grosser. <laughs> um, you, said, <laughs> you said, I'm a black man giving commentary to people about the state of the black condition, which is exactly what my father did, only with no punchlines. I feel like I'm surrounded by comedians doing political comedy who tell me over and over again, I'm not trying to change any money. I'm not trying to do anything. I'm just making jokes. John Stewart used to say, I'm on after a bunch of puppets making prank phone calls. Yeah. I'm not asking you to defend anybody or comment on that. What I want you to close off to is, does this, does comedy actually have a power that you're describing there? I think comedy has the power to activate people. But I think if you create comedy with the intention to activate people, then it feels more like impassioned public speaking. And you have to be careful about that. I think every comedian that talks like that, like the, the quote you read, I think they know that what they're doing has the ability to activate, but you have to stay connected and married to the joke. The joke remains the priority. It's part of the reason why The Daily Show doesn't touch a lot of stuff. Like the toughest thing to deal with during that time at The Daily Show was dealing with DMs from people who would go, why don't you talk about this thing? Well, you talked about it, but you didn't talk about it in depth enough to do da, 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 da. I don't have punchlines for that because that part is horrible. And there are parts of the world that are horrible. And until there's space to make it funny, it doesn't serve what this platform is able to do right now because it wasn't built for all of those things. This is a message you should send to Vice News because that is how they approach the horrible. So I think that there's places that do things better and there's things that we do better, you know? So yeah, I think, I don't, I don't think that, I think comedy matters, but I don't think you can create it with the intention of, ooh, this is the joke that's gonna fix the election. <laughs> Cause then you're just up there just being righteous and that's not funny. Um, this has been, a wild chat, man. I really enjoyed it. I appreciate to you. you. Yeah, I really do appreciate Thank talking you. to you as well. Thank you for coming in. 